Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another strong young player and uh, trainer joining us this week and author, of course. He has written two opening books with Thinkers Publishing, The Modernized Ready and The Modernized Dutch Defense. He has also recently done an online course for Chess24 on the London system. So we're going to talk some openings. He's also worked as a trainer on the French national team at Olympiads, worked with French uh, world youth teams. And in August, he's coming off a good result. In August, he tied for first in the accession open section at the French championship, which our guest was just telling me means he'll get to play in the um, the closed French championship next year. So without further ado, we have a lot to discuss. Adrian Demuth, um, I should say Grandmaster Adrian Demuth, thank you for joining the show. Hi, Ben. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. So first of all, congrats on, I know it's been a couple months, but I mean, it's a, this this result in the Paris, I mean, sorry, the, the French Open tournament is quite a good one and a, a big, I would imagine, result for your career with uh, with the fact that you get to play in the French Clothes Championship next year. So could could you tell us a little bit about how that tournament went for you? Yeah, actually, it's quite a difficult tournament because it's for player, players with more than 2,200 ELO, so they are uh, around maybe 60 players and you need to fight on every game because a short draw in in the first round is really bad so you you need to start well i managed to do it more or less uh, so i started with three and a half out of four and then it was a bit strange because there there were a lot of draws so finally we went uh, to finish with four players tied uh, for first place and and we we had only six and a half of, out of nine. I think it was the first time in the history of the of this tournament that uh, you can qualify with so low, so only six and a half points. Normally you you qualify with at least one point more. So and I finished second, and there were there were two places, so it's good for me for next year. Yeah, I mean that must have been a good feeling. Um, so. And it, and you were saying it, there was no tie break, right? So once you tie, um, you just it comes down to sort of the luck of the draw. How do you how do you feel about systems like that? Yeah, actually, it's really strange because uh, one of the player wa- was cl- pretty sure to be qualified uh, before the, after the, the last round, but there was this last game that was decisive for for the second place. And and it's like I had the, one of my opponent who needed to make a draw, and he was worse. And and if he had lost, I would have been third. <laughs> so it's like you don't, you can't do anything about it. If finally the game ended in a in a perpetual, in a threefold repetition where he was still worse. So it's quite lucky because the, the opponent didn't notice it. It was a repetition. But that's how I co- I qualified actually. So you did you hang out behind the board of that game and like make scary looks at the guy that you needed to draw? <laughs> no, actually, I was not around. Okay, I was just good. Good that you took the high road. Yeah, but I I don't know. My personal opinion. I've I've said this on the show, and um, sometimes I go on little Twitter rants about it. I really think there should be tie breaks when there are prizes that are that high stakes. What What's your opinion? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the best option because. Uh, Otherwise, you can always keep a, a bad feeling if it turns out badly for you. So this time I was happy, but of course I would have preferred just to play some games and and not being waiting for some stupid last game to finish. <laughs> yeah. So why do you think so many tournaments? I feel like there's a pretty clear consensus. I know they, um, 
your friend and colleague, Romain Edouard, uh, editor at Thinkers Publishing. He in the Isle of Man tournament, which obviously there was a, a huge tie going into the last round. And I know he said something on Twitter about he was a little disappointed that there was no tie break. So do you feel like there's a consensus amongst, uh, you know, top level players, the grandmasters like yourself about whether or not there should be tie breaks? I think most players uh, think that a real tiebreak is is the best way because sometimes the the difference between first and, and second is so important. I mean, for the candidates, it shouldn't be decided in in uh, the difference of maybe a few low points points uh, you have with your opponent. So yeah, I mean, it's a too big difference for something that is almost nothing. So. So I'm pretty sure most players, most grandmasters think uh, they, there should be some decisive tiebreak games. Yeah, orga- excuse me, organizers take note. And I guess, of course, one of the reasons they do it, and I think that this makes more sense sort of the, at, at tournaments that are not elite tournaments, um, is it's hard to schedule an extra day. Um, it's a lot to ask players to change their flights, but... Um, I feel like, especially at the highest levels, the prizes are high enough where where they should should do that. But um, do you do you know of any other reason why it's done the way it's done, other than just uh, tradition? For the candidates, I have no idea. I, actually, I was surprised that there was no game in Eidhofen to decide who was qualified. Uh, I know in in French in France for the French championships, um, they decided the type the title in tiebreak this year and. This is the same day as the last round, so the players are simply exhausted and and the games are generally not so good. So so I don't really I'm not really sure it's a better idea to, to play it the same day. I, I I think I agree with you. You should take one extra day to do um, a well organized tiebreak system. But if it's the same day just before the prize giving ceremony, then it makes it makes only little sense to me. Yes, you're simply too exhausted after the, the last. Yeah, one. yeah, of course that wouldn't that wouldn't be a, a great way to do it. Definitely, people need a rest day and a day to do a bit of prep and stuff like that. But yeah, but it's pretty clear that in most tournaments it's quite hard to schedule a, another game another day. Um, but of course, for something like the Eye of Man tournament, they they should have. Yeah. This. Yeah, for sure, with something that yeah. that important. So, having uh, gotten this um, this uh, prestigious award and this this great opportunity to play in the closed championship, does that does that change your approach to chess as a professional who does training and playing as well? Are you going to be trying to compete more based on that, or you just kind of have to to live your life? Uh, I'm not so sure yet. <laughs> I still have something like ten months to. Right. To work, but uh, no. Recently, I was more focusing on on teaching chess and writing some books. So I think it will help me uh, get back to work for myself and and try to be competitive at, at the championship. So I think it will uh, force me to to work for myself. If yeah. I want to do something good, then uh, I need to prepare. Otherwise, it's just too difficult. Yeah, of course. I mean, you've got Laurent Fresnay always plays, and I don't know, yes. MV- MVL may or may not make an appearance, um, and so so many strong players in France. And you guys seem like you have, in France, it's like there's a deep bench, too. There's there's a lot of grandmasters in France. Yeah, there are 50 tr- grandmasters, I think, and, and 10 are more than 2,600. Wow. So, of course, it's quite hard to get to the... Um, first close tournament with 10 players. Um, MVL is not playing anymore. I think it's quite normal. He has other priorities, but but there are all other strong strong opponents to, to play there. So. Yeah, and yeah. So, so what do you... I know that, and we'll, we'll definitely get to this, but you partially grew up in Tahiti, but are, are, are now based in France and have spent uh, many years in, in France. So to what do you attribute uh, the success of French players at, at the top levels? I think um, maybe it's because uh, in the 80s there were some Soviet players that came to France. Uh, so I think about uh, Boris Pasky, 
uh, about maybe Anatoly Vesia, who was several times um, senior uh, world champion. And this these players, these strong players and grandmasters, they they shared their their knowledge with with the players in France and at the time where where France was really not a chess uh, a big chess nation, um, we started to have some strong grandmaster first from the Soviet Union, and then of course some some players like René Olivier René. Uh, I think he was the first grandmaster in France, and then many others followed. And yeah, and then it was easier. And what's the, are there a lot of chess school programs, or um, is it done more at the the club level? What's uh, what's the general interest level of chess, uh, like uh, on a broader base? It's not so clear because it, it it's not uh, the same in every part of France. Uh, in some parts, you can have chess in schools. So, for example, in, in Corsica Island, um, they they are doing some even championships um, inside the island among the different schools, and they have tr- more than three three thousand competitors wow. in the same place. And so, they have um, chess as part of school. Uh, as well as for mathematics and 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 other other things, so it's exactly the same. They they do maybe one or two hours a week, mm-hmm. but in most other parts, it's like there is no chess school, there is no chess in school, and so it's only in clubs mainly. And yeah, I think they they sometimes try to go to go in school, but it's uh, during lunch or or after school, it's not really um, as the other the other things you do in school. Okay, yeah. So yeah. reasonably popular, but has room to grow as well. It sounds like yeah, for sure. Yeah. And obviously, right. I know it seems like French players are always rooting hard for for MVL up top. So obviously, if he could ever. Um, if he could win the world championship or even play in the world championship, although of course we've got to take care of the candidates first. Um, it seems yes. like that, that could be a, a big boost for French chess. Yeah, for sure. It could be, I think what Magnus did in, in Norway was a big improvement for, for chess. So it probably could be the same in France. I mean, uh, you, you will, if you talk about chess in television, uh, all the time and in the newspapers and then of course it's easier to to have children to do it in schools and to go to clubs it's more more appealing yeah to... cool all right well adrian let's talk about your your openings books so you've you've books and course i should say so you've written three of them the london system the ready and the dutch i uh i checked out the intro video of the london system on chess 24 and i read uh read some of your ready book. Um, I did not get a chance to take a look at the Dutch. I've, I've never been a Dutch player. So I have to admit I was, uh, that wasn't, um, that one wasn't my highest priority, although I was curious, of course. But one thing I noticed about those choices is it seems like you're, you're focusing on sort of, uh, especially in the case of the ready and the Dutch sort of less popular openings. Um, and I, kn- I also checked out your database a little bit and checked out your games. And I know that y- you dabble in these openings, but they're certainly not the only thing you play. So that made me wonder how you decide which openings to, to tackle. Um, it's quite difficult to say because I have always played many, many openings. Um, I've been interested in, like, the, we've, we've worked with the D4 systems uh, mainly. Recently, I tried to play e4, uh, but it's quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some hard times. Um, okay, at, at some point, I was uh, a bit disappointed with uh, my play after d4. So I started to play less common openings, uh, starting with knight f3. And at some point, um, I was getting very good results with it. It was like, for me, it was like um, very close to the D4 systems, but at the same time, uh, 
players with black were clearly knowing less on these openings. Like all of the transpositions and, and even the, the, the theory on the that is that has nothing to do with systems with D4. Mm -hmm. It was like uh, my opponents were not so aware of what they should do and clearly less compared to, to D4. And it was a bit the same as like I was playing sometimes big openings like the Sicilian and and one E4, E5, the main lines, but more or less my results were better when I was playing uh, side lines. So my approach uh, ever since was to to work deeply on the side lines and to always have um, more knowledge than my opponent on these systems. And have you found this to be true against players uh, all the way up to the grandmaster level, or is this, uh, or do you use the sidelines more as a weapon against uh, sort of um, club level, you know, twenty two hundred and below type uh, players? No, actually, in my games, I play uh, the same op openings almost uh, against every type of opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, for example. Uh, even when I, I had to play Anon, Vichy Anon with Black. Oh, yeah, that's in my notes, that game. <laughs> this is, no, but this is really typical because uh, I was like, if I play your main system, you will probably be uh, clearly better prepared than me. So what's the point in, in playing a main line? If, you, if I know I don't even have an edge in the opening, I will simply be suffering. So I just went for for a sideline in in the Steinitz um, Spanish, Deferred, right? Yeah, yeah. And and okay, he was not. Of course, he he doesn't meet uh, this system very often in in the high level games. So at least I I got a decent game and where he was not knowing things better than me. So um, at least <laughs> maybe he was understanding them. Better, but at least I, I had some knowledge I could use, and and it was useful for the game. So I always played uh, also sidelines against stronger players than me, and yeah. it worked quite decently. Yeah, listeners, let's not let's not bury the lead. Uh, Adrian won that game against Anon. Um, so just just an incredible result. I always like to to what players of your strength when I'm preparing for an interview, I like to call out my database and then sort of sort by highest elo and, yes. <laughs> and see what happened. So obviously in this case it kind of jumped off the page. The first one I see is oh oh you beat it on with black. Nice. Yeah, um, really my my main uh, my main game. Yeah, well, it doesn't get much better than that. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that actually was a bit sad it's true. Um uh, the night after after the game, because I was like, probably in my life, I won't beat um, a stronger opponent or a more famous one. Yeah. So it was like, I, okay, I did it, but then what's what's next? <laughs> I, th I think you'll be okay, but yeah, it's, <laughs> you, the, the, yeah. You beat the world champion. There's no universe. Cha I mean, not the sitting world champion, but for former world champion, there's no universe champion. So yeah, it doesn't yeah. Do doesn't get much higher. Um, so could you, I mean, you, you kind of, as you said, you got a playable opening, you, you did like a, a king side attack and then it, it was a complicated game. Um, and then it just double edged and then he basically made the last mistake and you won. So could you, could you take us through the emotions of the game a little bit? Like, uh, at the moment where you thought, wait, I might actually win this game. Actually, it was very strange because, uh, so yeah, the game was really complicated, uh, I was the first one to be in sight. Not, I, I think the last move he had about ten minutes, and I had maybe one or two minutes. Um, so, yeah, it was a really double edge game where I had pawns on the queen side, he had pawns on, on the king side. Very strange position, and and at the end he blundered. I mean, I think in move thirty nine or, or forty. So it was in Gibraltar, so I, I get my 50 minutes after move 40. And I'm still not sure I'm, I'm winning uh, because it just hap happened. So he did a mistake, but it's quite a forcing lines. Yeah, so, transition to an end game, right? Yeah, I was trying to, to calculate, and at some point I was like, maybe I missed something, but it's like he, he can't escape. 
And, and at some point, he just played two moves, two logical moves, and he resigned. He, yeah. So it was really fast, actually. Because, <laughs> and were because, you guys both in time trouble? Um, you mentioned no, when, you got more time, so I was just curious. No, when he blundered, he had uh, about 10 minutes. Okay. But you, so he, you were a little short on time? Yes, I think he was trying to 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 put some pressure on, right play on the my clock. Moves. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So uh, yeah, even even at the the level of Anand, I mean, it's a, it's always a tricky question of when your opponent's in time trouble, how do you approach it? Yeah, probably because he normally calculates uh, clearly faster than me. He was thinking that he shouldn't let me any time to to calculate on his. Uh, moves, so he played very, really, very fast. Okay, but w so when you traded queens, you you weren't immediately sure that you were winning. You no, had... he, I was quite. I, I thought it was quite maybe dubious, but uh, I my feeling was maybe I just missed something. Yeah, of course. Maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe he will catch my a pawn and I won't win, and maybe he will promote first. Uh, it was. A bit early to say that I was sure it, it was a, a bad thing, but but it seemed uh, it seems strange. But actually, he missed he missed uh, an important move, uh, a strange king move, and and after that, it was more or less all over. So yeah, and I'll uh, I'll I'll link to the game uh, for listeners, and um, there's a couple YouTube videos up of people analyzing the game if you if you'd like to check it out that way but yeah definitely a, a feather in your cap um so what did it feel like afterwards did you were you able to prepare for the next round were you feeling like you were riding high how did uh <laughs> how did you so go I, on with the tournament I, I got so many messages uh, after the game that it was a bit uh a bit of a distraction now uh, the, the the day after no actually first uh, my girlfriend arrived by surprise uh, this night, uh, so she had planned it. So right after the game, she jumped at me, and then a uh, few few seconds after, I had to go to to the interview. So of course it was a bit um, uphorizing, but uh, next the next day I had to play against uh, David uh, Navarro, Rapport. right? Yeah. No. Rapport. Oh, sorry. Not David. <laughs> Sorry, say the, say the name again. Richard Rapport. Ah, Richard. Okay, go ahead. And this was pretty interesting game, but finally I, I lost, and then I had to to get back playing player around 24, and it was like uh, the best part of the, of the tournament was gone. So. And is your girlfriend a chess player? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So I she, mean... She sorry. was not playing, but she arrived... Uh, okay. By surprise, it's just not pure pure luck. Right. Well, the good thing about beating a world champion is even if your girlfriend's not a chess player, she can understand the the magnitude. Um, no, she she knew, but actually, when she jumped at me, she was not sure I had won. It was not because there was a delay on the transmission, so it was like, "What did you do?" <laughs> <What> She's <laughs> just happy to see you, right? <laughs> That's it. Uh, that's a great story. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And we'll get back to the openings in a second. But do you? What are your other? I mean, I assume that's one of your favorite memories as a chess player. But do you do you have others that that you look back on similarly fondly? Um. Yeah, I have another game. Uh, when I did my second grandmaster norm, I I was playing in Andorra Open. I was playing in the middle of of the tournament. I think it was round five. Five probably. I was playing against uh, the super strong uh, Julio Granda Zuniga, mm -hmm. Peruvian player. Yeah, legend. Um, with Black as well, and actually the game is pretty similar to Anand's game. It's like I'm not so sure what's what's going on, and, and suddenly it, it's pretty complicated, and suddenly I happen to be winning. And more or less the same, um, when he he decided to just shake, shake hands and resign, I was like, did he offer a draw? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or did he simply resign? I, I was not so sure, because I felt like I had to be winning, but it, it 
to me, it, it, it seems like um, an early way to resign. Huh. That's a funny feeling. I think a lot of chess players have had that, although usually for most of us, not against players of that caliber. But <laughs> Yeah, because she doesn't simply stop clocks. She just share, share hands. So, it, yeah, I don't know. It was like, did, does he think, did he think I offered a draw? Or? <laughs> <laughs> That's I was not so, not so sure. So I waited I waited for him to 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 sign the, the, the copy and to score as you all run and <laughs> right. no, I, I was sure. <laughs> That's great. Cool. Okay, well Adrian, th- yeah, thanks for sharing those stories. Now now bringing it back to the opening. So one question I had is with the London system and the ready, obviously um they're not stylistically all that similar, but they're both similar in that they're less popular uh ways to play with white. Um, they're kind of system openings. Um, I was curious. I had a, two related questions, um, Some sort of looking at it from my perspective, but I think from a lot of sort of club players' perspective. Um, if you have a sense of if one line is one of those openings is more testing and also if one of them is more work than the other, if one were to try to adopt one of these openings, either as a surprise weapon or as their main repertoire. I think the two openings, the Reti and the Dutch, are, are or the are London. Quite- Starting with the ready uh, and the London, line. sorry. Um, I think they are. Anyway, I think they they are quite different because um, in the ready opening, uh, you want probably a slow system where um, you're trying to to get a comfortable middle game, and then you want to to outplay your simply outplay your your opponent mainly in the center, while uh, the basic idea in the London system is, to my eyes, it is to to get an attack on the king side, to get something like bringing a knight on, in the center and then bring the queen to f3 and h3, and trying to mate your opponent. So the two openings doesn't ha- follow the same rules, I think, um, and also um, in the red opening. It's clearly also more uh, complicated to play because you can have many kinds of setups, of different setups. Um, you don't necessarily push the same pawns in the center. Maybe you don't even push any pawn, and it depends. Uh, while in the London, it's quite okay. The first moves are quite obvious. You will more or less always play the same. So um, this is. Yeah, definitely different. In the London, you want to play the same, and then you generally have um, a couple of different plans. But um, you can play the London with uh, less knowledge, I I think, than the ready. Oh, interesting. Because, yeah, yeah, I mean, a couple things about the ready. I was... uh, I I was reading the book on forward chess. It's obviously a a great way to to study opening books. And I, I was... Interested. I mean, first of all, I was glad to see that you don't concede the center entirely, which is, um, which is you know sometimes a concern with the ready. Um, yeah, the, the, this was my main my main goal actually. Uh, yeah. Choose lines where black couldn't get two pawns in the center. Otherwise, I think it's just too much. Yeah. You, you can allow one pawn like the d5 or the c5 pawn, but not both of them. Yeah, I think that's important as a selling point for for listeners. I mean, it's yeah, it's just otherwise it just seems to 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 concede too much. Yes. Um, so I was glad to see that, but I was I was surprised by the amount of theory. I guess I I'm historically more of an e4 player, so I'm not as well versed to begin with in all of the transpositions that that you get into. But yeah, I mean there there's so many little subtleties that I can see how you I can see what you mean about it being more work. Yeah, I, I mean, it's probably because uh, when you play something like knight f3, intending a slow plan like g3 or maybe b3, uh, that means that black can do many, many systems. Um, he he can push any pawns he wants. He, he can even play the same as you. And you don't uh, really decide the game um, as it happens after e4 or d4. It's clearly different. You are not intending to, to grab the center, so so black clearly has um, free hands, and you as well. So so I think 
necessarily it means that um, there should be at probably at least um, as much theory as after E4 or D4. It, it, I think there is only less because it's uh, less played. So mm -hmm. we don't think it's it's so important, but uh, basically there there I think there are probably as many nines as as in the other first moves. Yeah, and I, I like that in, in the book, you you seem to be reasonably objective. Like, there are positions where you, you might say it's equal, but I think white side is easier to play or something like that. Um, it's it's always I'm always glad to see when people aren't just, like, pretending that the side they advocate is just much better in every position. Yeah, no, there is even a line, I think, in the King's Indian where I finish the line and I say, okay, it, it's a perpetual and you, you don't have better, but it was a pretty forcing line and... And I, I was like just saying, okay, maybe if your opponent knows everything, maybe you have to to agree to a draw here. But um, first, probably he won't remember any anything, and he will just play something very different. And also to compensate, I'll also provide uh, another way to play the opening. Uh, but yeah, sometimes uh, I think. Anyway, I think that in in theory, um, after e4, after d4, after knight e3, uh, black always have a way to to keep an equal position. Um, and actually, I have a story about that because I was talking about theory with uh, the grandmaster Josef Dorfman, uh, living in France. And at some point after a game that we drew, he, we talk about chess and. And he tells me, you know, Adrian, today every opening is equal. You take even the worst opening, the Benoni. Even the Benoni. <laughs> the Benoni, oh no, that's fired at, at <laughs> Even the, the Benoni is equal. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, with the Reti, I, I can't promise you a, an, an advantage in the opening. Otherwise, I'm just lying, of course. So there has to be a line where, where Black is, is okay. I'm pretty sure of it. I've but, seen. I mean, Fabiano has trotted out the Benoni at the top level once or twice. So, um, no, yeah. but uh, I'm pretty sure Yosif is right. I, I, yeah. I, I think uh, probably the Benoni is equal. But uh, the thing is, there are probably openings where you need to be more precise than others. Yeah, for sure. Probably the Dutch uh, and the Benoni are, are openings that where you need to be very precise to keep the balance. Yeah. So speaking of that, um, why why the Dutch? Why did you decide that this was a uh, this was another project you'd like to undertake? Um, first, because uh, there is a common point with uh, the Reti. It's like it is that um, there are only a few good books mm -hmm. on, on these openings, uh, especially the Reti. There, yeah. There were, no real books that were providing a full repertoire for white. Uh, I mean, I had one uh, providing a repertoire after 1d5, but that's it, not against the other moves. And the Dutch, I was, I, I had some books. Uh, I know there are some good books, um, but sometimes uh, the lines were not any more very strong because of, of computers. Maybe some lines were simply refuted, so I felt like um, the theory on, on, the, on the Dutch uh, needed some some improvement, and yeah, I was try, quite happy to try to do it. And I was playing the, the Dutch myself, so, so it was quite logical choice, I think. That makes sense. And how, how have your results been with the Dutch? Uh, since the uh, book was pu published, you mean? Well, just generally. Uh, generally, it was okay. I, actually, strangely enough, I I had many draws, mm -hmm. uh, which is not so logical with this opening. But uh, I played it against player from twenty three hundred to to twenty seven, and I won a few games. I I drew plenty of them, but. I think I only lost one recently. Wow! So you're holding your own for sure. More or less. I ha it was quite a bad loss against Kledura in in the European Championship, but okay. Happens. The opponent is tough, and the line was pretty critical. So I, 
I just simply at some point I just completely lost the track of the game. Okay. And the Dutch, I feel like it's got a small but loyal fan base amongst chess players. Like it's, you know, it's not as popular, but the people who like it will really go to the map for it. Um, but I was obviously, especially at the top level, you don't see it super often. So th- from your perspective, is there one line against it that that makes it uh, less appealing for top players? Or is it more just that it's um, that you have to be so precise throughout? Probably it's a bit both, but I think there are there are a couple of of lines in the main line um, where white, uh, for example, there is this this line where white wants to to crush black. He plays something with c4, knight c3, and then an early h4, mm-hmm. Harry, trying yeah. to 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 destroy the the pawn on g6, and so I think. Some some players are quite afraid of this kind of system. I mean, even in in top level. And um, but okay, still we see some games of of Carlsen sometimes of Caruana. So yeah, but they, I think they have more been playing the the Stonewall system, mm-hmm. which is a bit different than what I'm offering. But but still, uh, actually, I, I more or less discovered. Uh, the Leningrad Dutch with black. Uh, when I saw some games of um, Gatakamski that he played in in the US, I, I think in 2013, and he he won a couple of games against Gelfand and Nakamura, and it all seemed so so simple for him. So so at some at at that point it was like White had no clue how to handle. Um, get us play so yeah it started to be quite appealing to me and and i think in 2014 one year later i started to to play it myself okay well it's good i mean I, like i said i know the dutch fans are glad to have uh grandmasters um still still uh, wading into the waters of the Dutch and uh, find, finding ways to make it playable because it certainly, I mean, it, it appeals to dynamic players who, who you know, don't want to be playing the, the Queen's Gambit declined and stuff like that. So, um, Yeah, for sure. It's for players that want to do something uh, more dynamic and, and a bit clearly different than other openings. Cool. Clearly and, double-edged. And do you have another project in the works regarding openings? Um, I'm talking talking about that with Romain Edward, but uh, it's not so clear yet. Maybe some something with black against e4. As I, I did something for white. I did something for black against d4 and knight f3 and c4. So it's quite logical to do it for black against e4, but it's not so sure yet. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you consider yourself having... I mean, especially when I'm thinking of your work with the uh, Olympiad, the French national teams, do you consider yourself sort of an opening specialist or has that just sort of, uh, that's, you know, as a professional, that's what the demand, uh, that's what the market wants. So that's what you give. Yeah, the, the demand is clearly, nowadays, I, I think most people, they just uh, want to know a lot about theory and and it's a bit sad, but they take less care about other part of chess, such as uh, strategy and, and even tactic, tactics and, and the end games, of, of course. I think uh, at every level, they, people are, are using too much theory and they are doing too much theory in their work. Um, so the demand is, is in theory, but also I think I, uh, I'm like every other player. I, <laughs> I also prefer to work on theory, so yeah. I, I more or less um, I specialized in this area, and and yeah, I think it's my main main weapon. It's my yeah. Opening well, I, I mean, so. yeah, and at your level, it makes sense to spend a lot of time on openings. I mean, it's it's you know, your the other aspects of your game are are obviously um, pretty good. Yeah, it, so it's clearly the main thing because yeah. yeah you, also, it's it's more helpful because you know that at some point you will be able to use it. Oh, maybe not every line, but 
uh, if you work um, on a full repertoire, you know that uh, at every game you will be able to to use it. While uh, when you study maybe end games, it's a bit disappointed because maybe you study something and you don't play this in the next five years, right. and then when it when it comes up, then you forgot what you <laughs> what you worked on. So so it's like you a waste of time. But uh, at least with the opening, you're pretty sure that in the next tournament you will be able to to use something. For that's sure. a, yeah, that's a good point. And it, yeah, like you say, it it provides a feeling of comfort. So. Whether or not it actually helps you win the game, especially like uh, again at the lower levels, um, it's you feel better. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, it's clear that in my games, uh, I score better when uh, I get an opening that I know I know good and and that I like simply. Uh, yeah, it makes clearly a difference. So, what? Uh, speaking of um, what people should do to improve. Um, Aside from openings, what advice do you find yourself giving to to the young players and the students that you work with? What what do you think the best way to to use one's study time is? <laughs> uh, usually, uh, I tell them that they need to be absolutely a killer at uh, at tactics. So they had to be very strong and and very. Um, very quick in for the calculation of, of variations, and this is probably the main thing for for the youngster. Um, too many games are decided on on tactics, so so they have to be just to uh, to be flawless in in this era. And also, um, simply the the main end game, because uh, I always used to tell them that. Uh, when they calculate something, something in the end game, um, if they get a position they can't assess, which is quite simple. I, we are speaking about maybe recently one of my students who is uh, 2200. He told me, ah, I can. I was fighting for a draw. I could game get this end game with a rook and two pawns versus a rook and three pawns on the same. Um, part of the board um, on the king side and he told me but I, I didn't know if it was a draw or if it was maybe winning for him I, I didn't want to suffer and I told him this kind of things you need to know for sure so, so we did some work on, on the rook end games it seemed to me too too obvious to miss these things you need to assess uh, precisely a position maybe you don't know precisely how to play it but you need to assess it uh, yeah. without any calculation. Yeah. So, what resources do you do you recommend for for people who who need to improve such aspects of their game? There are some pretty good books. I, I think for the end games, uh, the books uh, is still the best way because um, it's not so so easy to to get something uh, if you just look at. Um, the recent games where there were where there were some end games. Sometimes it's just too complicated when you see a game of Magnus. Okay, mm-hmm. it's well played, but if you can't do the same, then you basically learn nothing. So, so I, th- I think the books are as the best for the end games. So uh, the books any of, books in particular? I grew up with the book of Odvoretsky and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and manual of endgame and I still think it's one of the best but there is this one of uh, Jeremy Silman which is quite uh, interesting and also I think um, a book of Glenn Fleer about practical play in the endgame sorry who is the author? Fleer. Uh, Glenn Fleer okay and in do you have a sense person. so the Dvoretsky book um, uh, obviously is for, for strong players probably 2200 ish up um, the Silman book is is much more accessible um, for yes. players of all levels. What about the Glenn Fleer book? I think it's more or less all level because it takes uh, opening, uh, it it takes end games where um, you don't really know if it's winning or not. It's like there are too many pieces. Um, maybe there are still bishop and knight and some mini pawns, but it's practical. It means. He's trying to explain um, every principles in the end games, 
and he's not interested in in the theory of endgame where you need to know uh, how you draw uh, a rook endgame or something he doesn't really care about that he just wants to to provide the the, um, the people who who read it some some tips of how to actually play the pra- what happens in the games actually to to be able to to have uh, some principles and i think it's maybe the best thing because um it's one thing to to be able to draw something you know but it's only particular cases and and it's much better to to have a good technique and to to know how to play more or less how to fill the position and it's more or less what he's trying to to provide the readers okay sounds good um yeah. and and for tactics for tactics i think uh, there are some books uh, the, the books of romain Edward, these yeah. are quite uh, yeah. I mean, quite good. Uh, I'm not. I mean, they're recommended all the time, so we can't just say yes. that you're you're just trying to <laughs> just trying to pump no, no, your I friend's know. work. <laughs> no, no, they are. I mean, well renowned, so I think they are quite good. But also, even starting uh, with the website uh, providing this kind of of things, I think on Leeches or Chess.com you can. Um, work on tactics but the problem with uh, the websites is uh, generally uh, the players do it wrong it's like they see a move it's like the, the obvious sacrifice for example and they just want to play it and then yeah. they, they are waiting for black answer and maybe it, actually maybe it's not even the working but but at least they're playing without much thought and this is not really helpful so what I used to say is that um, if you play, if you do this on the website, if you find the move, the obvious move, but if you're the move of, of the opponent you didn't notice, you didn't think about it, then you just um, didn't really understand the, the, the thing because it means that you, you didn't uh, calculate the best uh, way for black to play. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's so, to, it's so easy to just click when you're doing the yes. the online trainers. Yeah, yeah, I think. But if you manage to to just uh, do it properly and just think to every variations uh, beforehand, then then it might be helpful for sure. Okay, excellent, uh, excellent uh, advice. Um, do you have any particular? I mean, so Romain's books. Do you know of any tactics books for for less advanced players? Um, I think there is a book I'm using uh, of Chaba Balog. Uh, I think it's called something like 556 puzzles. I think it's something like this. There is a strange number. And there, there are examples of, of many levels from easy to difficult. And, and I, I know it's quite good as well, but I know there are many tactics books uh, for every level, so... Romain's books are more for, I mean, already advanced player, but there are also tactics for, I mean, even beginners, so you can find everything. Okay. Um, all right, and Adrian, last topic, if you're up for it. Um, I just wanted to talk about your your globetrotting, your travels and growing up in Tahiti. Um, so what, what? First of all, what is uh, was there chess in Tahiti? Were you already... Competing a lot when you live there? Um, yeah, I think uh, every kind of, of islands uh, more or less have the same problem. So I, start, I started to play chess in Tahiti when I was seven uh, with my father. Then I liked it, so he brought me to a club. There were two clubs in, in Tahiti Island. And the main thing is, uh, the main problem is there are only a few strong opponents and also you always uh, used to play the same um, it's like uh, when I was little I, I, I think the best players were around 1700 something like this so I reached um, 1600 
quite fast, maybe at 9 or 10 years old. And then you can't really make progress because uh, if you don't have people clearly stronger than you, uh, then then it's may, mainly impossible to, to make pro progress to to get to know what what's good or what's not. If the advice you get are, are simply wrong, then you can't you you can't take any good of it. So yeah, I think it's a main problem. And recently they are trying to develop in Tahiti chess in schools. So the same as in Corsica and and yeah. Uh, the, the result is quite satisfying because um, every child in Tahiti uh, has to play chess in school. Every child. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And so that makes maybe, I'm not sure, but around probably 20,000. It's not so little number. I think 20,000 childs are, are taught chess um, at least one year in, in their courses. So yeah, it's a big achievement. But the other problem is, even if you have, if you uh, manage to to find a, a particularly strong child, a gifted child, then it's quite hard because there is no real, no proper tournament. So if he wants to play, he has to go back to France, but it's very far. Yeah. Or or he has to go to maybe New Zealand or Australia, which are the the closest countries but he needs to speak to speak in English and it's already maybe six or seven um, hours of playing so yeah it's quite complicated to to manage to play tournaments yeah plus I mean I've never been to Tahiti but it, I mean it looks so so beautiful it, it seems like it would be hard to focus on chess <laughs> in like a tropical paradise yeah it's difficult but okay you so you can just spend uh all day at the beach so yeah. you need to to do something else at some point <laughs> i suppose and you can bring your chess books to the beach too so of course <laughs> <laughs> um so and then you've also i saw you played in australia you played in new zealand so is that all um these sort of um uh i mean not these distant places from france is that because of the time you spent in Tahiti that, that you choose to play there, or are you just trying to see as many places as you can? Yeah, it's probably because I grew up far from France. I, I like to travel, so so with chess, the good thing is you, you can manage to find tournaments um, in every part of the world. So when I have, as a grandmaster, when I have an offer to play some, somewhere where I'm interested to go, then I, in general, if I have time, I... I take time to go. So yeah, I, I went uh, twice in Australia. I went to New Zealand. In okay. many parts of of Europe, of course, and I played in the US also. I'm trying to 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 play to play in many different parts of the world. And what's your favorite place that you've played? Uh, actually, it's or probably, coached, I should say. Um, no, I think it's probably Australia because uh, the country is so fascinating, and and they are trying to 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 have some some strong tournaments. They are doing some grandmaster norm tournaments and some very strong opens. And yeah, the places is very nice to visit. The people are really cool, and I think I will get back there. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been once. I would love love to go back um someday. Yeah. Um, and what else uh, outside of chess? Do you uh, what uh, what other interests do you have? Uh, mainly uh, the films. So I mean, cinemas and and series. Uh, I actually spend too much time <laughs> <laughs> in watching movies, and and yeah, this is probably my my main interest right right now. Do you have like a type of movie that you're into? Uh, it can it can be actually it can be many types of, of movies, but um, so from superheroes movies to to some historic historic movies, I don't really as as long as the the story is in, in, entertaining, I'm quite happy to see it. And speaking of which, there is in France in so in French language. There is a new film um, about chess that is um, pretty pretty interesting. 
uh, probably the best film uh, movie ag- about chess that I oh excellent to see. Uh, it's about so it's called Fahim so it's about a friend of mine so it's a it's a young um, Bangladesh player who went to France when he was 11 years old he became a French champion while he didn't have any paper to be in France and he managed to get the nationality of out of it and yeah it's a very beautiful story a real story and and the movie is really good so people should go to see it and in France it's quite a, a big success that's are, great so hopefully that that yeah. filters filters through to um more interest in chess generally certainly some movies yeah, have had that so, yeah. that effect yeah, in the past yeah i don't i'll look into so it looks like it's called Fahim, the Little Chess Prince in in English. Yes. Um, there, is, that's, there are some good actors, so pretty well known actors. Awesome. So yeah, we'll uh, yeah, uh, Gerard Depardieu. Um, yeah, exactly. We'll uh, we'll look into when it's making its way into uh, English with subtitles. But um, but yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, oh, uh, last thing. So what's, what's, uh, what's up for you the rest of the year? Do you have any uh, coaching or playing obligations lined up? Uh, I'm going to play some tournaments. So I'm heading to Malta Island in a few days. Oh, wow. Uh, you, so you, know how to, you know how to pick <laughs> your destinations. <laughs> yes, I don't know this one. So, so I will discover Malta and play the Open that starts uh, in 10 days. And probably uh, the Roma Open in in December. Okay, sounds yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah, All right. yeah, quite well, well, Adrian, congrats on on your successes with your books, and uh, obviously in the uh, looking ahead to the French Championship next year. Um, is there so is there a way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, are you on uh, any social media, or do you want to? I don't know if you want to share your email address or what, but. Yeah, I, I'm on on Facebook, so it's okay. the easiest way to follow me. But I'm not a public person, so I okay. don't share that much, at least. Okay. But I'm still on Facebook, and and there are some some things that I'm probably. Okay, published. and obviously, if if you're talking with Romain, uh, people can keep an eye on what's happening with uh, Thinkers Publishing. Hopefully, you guys yeah, sure. can come up with another project. But in the meantime, there's. Plenty to go through with the modernized ready, the modernized Dutch defense, and of course your London system course on Chess Twenty Four, which I'll, I'll do respect. But the fact that you said that the London system is less work—if <laughs> if, <laughs> if I have to pick one, I think that's yes. the one. I, that's the one I'd go with. Um, that's my advice. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, well, Adrian, ha- have a good day and uh, and continued successes. Thank you so much for for inviting me. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. The ways to do so include writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform, telling a friend, spreading the word on social media. All of that stuff helps. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, my PayPal and Patreon Perpetual Chess Partners. Here we go. They are extra special thanks to Chessable.com and Quality Chess Books and the Capital City Chess Club, Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Cow, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guvin Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Duray, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Can, my main man, Moonmaster 9000, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan, Todd Kennedy, and I'd also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Tarakov, Andrew Perry, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, 
Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ario, who may be an IM elect or maybe just has the titles, and I'm not sure if that makes him an IM elect, but thank you, Donnie, anyway. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geer Vanderveld, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Onfang, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Zlosnik, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reifort, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Swanee, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William H. Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you all next week.